Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. I am Jeremy Gilbertson. I'm on the right side of your screen today, uh, coming to you from Atlanta, Georgia, with my friend Mark Fielding across the pond. Mark, how are you today, sir? I am excellent today. Thank you, Jeremy. Friday, not our usual Thursday spot, but I like to go into the weekend with a bang. So I'm very excited about this. Uh, yeah, we should also add Disruptors and Curious Minds, but also today, War and Peace Nicks in honor of our very special guest. So very quickly, for those who don't know me, I'm Mark. I'm a writing mercenary available to hire to the highest bidder. Um, and that's it. No small talk, talk no chit chat. Let's get to the main event, Jeremy. Yeah, absolutely. Quick shout out to our sponsor, Ripple, uh, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, Marketing's On Demand Talent Platform. They've been a great partner of us, of ours and uh, allowed us to do some really great things. So if you're looking to flex out, got a project, uh, whether it's a website or a, a, some deep strategy work, they've got over 3,000 solopreneur pre-vetted freelancers. Uh, Mark and I are actually on that list too, should you decide if we could be helpful to you. So uh, thanks to Ray and Dixie and the folks at Ripple. Without further ado, Mark, let's jump right in. I'm really excited about our guest today. There's a lot to unpack. Why don't you give a quick intro and then we'll, we'll bring them on. Yeah, I think most of our guests are familiar. Evan Shapiro, the, the media cartographer. He is a writer, a thinker, a at times controversial figure he's a, a keynote speaker and as i've said in a few posts recently i don't think anybody he might be able to collaborate or disagree with, knows more about the media landscape in 2023 than evan so yeah ladies and gentlemen evan shapiro welcome to the show and i'm going to start and i'm going to let you introduce yourself but do you think you could introduce yourself introduce the media landscape and for our guests do that with the bull case and the bear case for Netflix is the, can we can can we can you do all of that in your introduction in my introduction well I think <laughs> you did a really good job of introducing me I don't know that I can approve upon that all I mean I I started my uh, I'm a recovering television executive uh and so I've run uh, television networks IFC Sunday's channel I created a channel for participant media called Pivot, RIP. I created a streaming service for NBC called CISO, RIP. Um, uh, I also teach at NYU and Fordham in the business schools that teach media and entertain the business of media and entertainment. Um, but yeah, I write about the, the media industry uh, on my newsletter, uh, Media War and Peace. Uh, uh, there's a nice plug. Um, I, I write you know, for free on LinkedIn. I consider myself, I guess, uh, one of the OG linked influencers. Um, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the reason I write, I, I, when I was inside, um, corporate media, um, I got paid a lot to not be listened to. So I got paid mm. gobs of money, um, to have people, they would bring me in cause they thought they wanted a disruptor. And then the second you start getting in there and actually suggesting you disrupt the business, they're like, wait a second. <laughs> yeah, people don't like that. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I just, I got, I, I got paid a lot of money for a decent amount of time to be ignored. Um, and so when I left Comcast, uh, mostly by their decision, uh, and went out on my own, I decided to basically start saying the things I was saying internally aloud, louder and more often um, to try to help people um, the other executives, frustrated executives and, and, and practitioners in media um, understand what was happening around them, um, but also, um, you know, have, I think, a better understanding of the, the, the overall, um, we have so much data that gets spit at us at, on a regular basis um, that it's hard to know what the, the chafe and the wheat are necessarily. And therefore, I think it's often um, you know, difficult to understand the trends that are being mapped out in front of us. Um, because you can, you can equal weight often is given to a thousand person survey <laughs> and a million data point, um, you know, piece of, uh, behavioral technology. Um, you know, you look at surveys from like companies like Harris, which are thousand people surveys. And then you look at data from antenna, which is literally millions of data points and they're given equal weight in the marketplace as if they're the same thing. And that's just bonkers. Um, so I really wanted to try to take, um, the truth math and turn that into actionable insights. And when you look at Netflix, when you look at a company like Netflix, the, the, the bull case for it is, um, they have more subscribers, 
um, than any other video platform paying subscribers than any other video platform on the face of the earth. Um, they ha gained 9 million subscribers last quarter. Um, they are now in a positive cash flow uh, position, which is rare when you look at their entire history. Um, and so they are the most successful streaming paid streaming platform on the planet earth without question. There's not even a close second place because nobody else is really profitable. Uh, and nobody else has been able to both acquire and maintain the number of subscribers in as many territories as they have, as Netflix has the, the, the bull side is they're just a television channel. now. Um, they're a mature business. They're a television channel. Um, and they're a television channel with one revenue stream. And in the history of television, um, you have to go back, you know, 50, 60 years to find a profitable, a truly long-term profitable, sustainable television channel um, that had one revenue stream. And that was back when there were three channels broadcast um, and they only had advertising. Right. Um, now you're in a, a, a cacophony, uh, a cornucopia, a smorgasbord of choice. Good words. Right? And, uh, you know, I opened my thesaurus early this morning. <laughs> and, um, and you, you know, you, what you see is yes, they increased their subscriber base last uh, quarter, but that's because they're cracking down on password sharing. It's exclusively because they're cracking down on password sharing. Oh, okay. It's not because people are finding new things to watch there because they're not. Nice. Viewership, um, uh, uh, Next TV actually issued a report this week that showed that viewership on Netflix is actually decreasing, uh, not increasing. And that's, you know, for two different reasons. One, they're losing content from major other providers who are now their direct competitors. And then secondarily, it's hard to find something to watch. Um, you know, you, you, you get on your search. I, I did watch the new David Fincher movie, which was meh. The killer. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, that's kind of the, 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 you know, as they shoot much more towards the middle and away from the edges, as they become, you know, another Walmart of television, um, and you know, the, the processed Velveeta cheese of streaming content, um, it's going to be harder and harder for people like me who don't watch Love Island, you know what I mean? Who don't watch the same stuff that everybody else watches to find stuff to watch. And I'm the high end user, right? So I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, you know, recurring subscriber um, who, you know, even if I don't watch during a month, I keep my subscription, but how long am I going to do that? And then secondarily what's happening because of this increased um, competition in paid streaming, what's happening is an antenna, um, you, know, you know, just quick side note, uh, do both of you have banking apps on your phone? Yeah, um, I do. Yes. Do either of you read the terms and conditions of the banking app before you installed it and shared all, all, all two hundred pages of it? No. Yeah. It, yeah. It's yeah. well. This is this is interesting. Real quick, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw something at you because I I think I know where you're going. It's this it's this convenience versus privacy seesaw that I always think about. This it's like ways when you drive around town and avoid traffic, you're giving away all the stuff. But go ahead. Yeah, I'm down. Yeah, with my my yeah. app's in French as well, so like I definitely haven't read it. <laughs> <laughs> so so. Um, Antenna actually has deals with banking apps to track transactions. So they're, they're not surveying people whether they cancel their subscriptions to these different services. They know. They know, you know, they don't know specific people, but they know how many people sign up for premium streaming services and how many people cancel. And they came out with a study or their recent report that showed that one third of new subscribers to premium streaming services right now, one third. Uh, are what they call and I call serial churners, people who sign up for a service, binge the fuck out of something, and then cancel before the next billing cycle. And when I ask rooms full of discriminating high-end users if they've ever done that, most of the room raises their hand. I've done it. I did <laughs> it like last month, yeah. So churn is up 28 to 30% across the entire industry um, you know, year on year. And Netflix is ex going to experience that. After this bump of password uh, crackdown sharing, uh, sh password sharing crackdown happens, and they're going to get this bump and it's going to continue. It's going to roll out because they're just, they're, they didn't roll out all the crackdown at once, by the way. They, they're rolling it out in cohorts. Um, and, and I know this because I have students who say like, all of a sudden I was asked to pay for this, uh, uh, Netflix that I've been sharing with my parents. And I'm like, just now they're like, yeah, 
that started months ago. So they're rolling it out month after month, quarter after quarter. So they don't see this big upswing and big downswing. Netflix is very good at hiding the actual usage on their platform. And, and so one, their viewership is going down. Two, they're going to face a churn problem. And three, their ad product is a fucking joke. Um, they, uh, a couple weeks ago on the first anniversary of their ad product, um, their new head of ad sales, who's never worked in ad sales before, never had a job in advertising before hmm. ever, um, issued a blog celebrating their one year anniversary, uh, of their ad product and celebrating the accomplishments and the new, uh, features they were adding. So the major accomplishment that they touted was 15 million monthly active users on their ad tier. Do you know how adorably small that is? Do you is know how insignificant twice, that yeah. is? Monthly, not subscribers, not 15 right. million subscribers, 15 million monthly active users. To put that in context, uh, Samsung uh, uh, TV Plus has 100 million oh, wow. active users. Yeah. Pluto has about 180, 90, 100 million monthly active users. YouTube has... 2.7 billion, 2.7 billion monthly active users. Uh, TikTok is 1.7 billion monthly active users. Instagram has 2 billion monthly active users. If you had a website that had 15 million monthly active users, you couldn't get through the front lobby of most advertising agencies in, in advertising right now. It's like not, it's not a real number. What's and it's going not a on? meaningful. Are they, are they panicking? Are they just feel like they have to? Like, hey, why have they hired someone who's had no experience in in advertising to be that spokesperson anyway? And, and yeah, what's driving their dropping the ball so much, so badly, so dramatically? Well, they moved. They moved their so they fired the person they hired to run ad sales, and then they moved somebody who was in content acquisition over to run. So she's been at the company some time. Um, but she's never worked in ad sales before. Frankly, other than the new people they've brought in to work in advertising, no, nobody there's ever worked in advertising. The major problem at, at Netflix is their last innovation was streaming. Their last, think about it, the last major, other than like UX and UI improvements or their top 10 list, which is not a tech improvement, um, but just kind of a packaging improvement. Um, you know, the major, the last major innovation at Netflix was when they went from discs to streaming. Name, an uh, name another major innovation on that platform since. It's not uh, an innovation, adding, but they tried, they've added gaming, haven't they? Is they have they something? added gaming? Learning have you ever played platform? a Netflix game? <laughs> no, I haven't. Okay. They've added people. They haven't put anything out yet. Yeah. Yep. And so, and so, you know, they don't really, they added podcasts that was short lived. Um, you know, they, they're not, they are not an in, innovative, they're not innovative. They're not an innovative company anymore. Um, and you know, they were forced basically at gunpoint by their own CEO on an earnings call where they had a really bad subscriber quarter, uh, almost two years ago, year, year and three quarters ago, um, to add advertising. And he didn't even tell the executives on the call that he was going to do that. And then they rushed to get this ad product out and it's a disaster. It's a dumpster fire. Um, it's too expensive. None of the buyers want to buy it and no one's using it. There are no users there. The, the big innovation that, so that yes, that we have 15 million monthly active users, which is basically saying my third grader grew two inches. Um, and then secondarily, uh, their thing is like our new innovation is we're adding 30 and 60 second ads. That, that most people would pay to avoid in a way too. I mean, like yes, that, yeah. but like every television channel on the face of the earth has right. 30 and 60 second ads. Like that's not right. an innovation. Right. Wow. Like, oh, well, we suddenly breathe in and out. And That's so funny. when you, when you, so you talk a lot about the, I love your analogies you, you use, like the, the media apocalypse, the streaming wars, your, your, your newsletter is war and peace, Nick's. And um, you've spoken about the, the user centric era. And is this where Netflix, the real bear case for Netflix arises? Is this where they're doomed? Could you explain? I, I mean, doomed. I don't like is doomed is doomed is hyperbolic. They're not going to go out of business, but they're going to basically gently become what CBS is now. 
you know, there, the, if you want to see what, what Netflix looks like in five years, look at CBS now, look at Fox right now. They're becoming, they are just basically a television channel, the best television channel on the planet earth. Well, make no mistake. They are better at being a television channel than anyone else on the planet is right now. Um, but that's not a long-term growth business anymore. No. That is a declining business. Um, and it is one that's going to come under increasing pressure from the big tech death stars because Apple is also a television channel, but they are also an audio channel and they also provide you iPhones and they also provide you cloud storage and they also have an actual gaming platform and they also, also have a news product and they also have major league baseball and they also have major league soccer. Netflix has none of those things. Netflix ha has a TV channel. So what's the difference between um, basically Netflix now and ABC, which is a product that Bob Iger is desperately trying to sell like an old man in a bathrobe with a car table on his lawn? Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a better version of ABC in that it has an algorithm that, that feeds you content. Um, but long term, five years, 10 years, it's, it's not a growth business. It's not doomed. It will continue to be profitable. It will continue to be successful, but it's going to plateau. You know, it's, it's going to be, it, it's, it's, it's up and to the right is over. Um, it's now going to be a plateau for, for a, a, a very long period of time, probably a decade. And then it will start to decline just like CBS, Fox, ABC, and NBC are doing now. So, you know, it's a bear case because its growth is over. Um, it, it, and, and, and that's, you know, that's really it. Like when you look at what they're doing now, they're talking about 8% revenue growth, right? They're talking about managing to the bottom line. They're talking about free cash flow. These are things that mature businesses do, not growth industries. That's a, that's a really good point too. And you can almost say like Netflix is just a piece of what other successful companies are doing beyond it. It's just a little piece of the equation. It's not the end all be all anymore. Um, I want to, I want to go back to churn. You, you brought up churn and, uh, I love the stuff you do because it's rooted in numbers, right? There is some subjectivity into some things and some analysis that you do, but you have the background to provide that, but the numbers don't lie. Right? So you did a study, uh, 27,000 ish participants, 7% of those people said, and, and correct me if my phrasing is wrong, that they're going to stay with their existing slew of apps or, or engagement means, right? So how do you design, if you're a media company, how do you design a strategy for that? Yeah. And that's very accurate. That is exactly what the survey said. 7% said that they were going to stay with the suite of subscription services that they have today. And by the way, that's across video, audio, gaming, news, sports, the whole, anything you can subscribe to. Um, and then Hub Research put out uh, another study. So that study was with Publishers Clearinghouse, 27,000 people. Hub Research put out a study that showed that um, no matter how many uh, different services you have, um, free and paid, less than half are considered must have. So 93% of consumers are reconsidering more than half of their different services on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's easier to cancel something and, and swap out of it than it's ever been. Um, we, we, are, we, are, we have entered the user-centric era um, is one where the consumer is in complete control and changes the suite of services, the bundle of services that they program for themselves in their system settings with the thumbs every morning. Right. They just they cancel, they uncancel, they subscribe, they unsubscribe, um, you know, pretty much regularly. And the serial churner is this existential crisis that is facing all the entire subscription economy, but also free free uh, as well, because I can just as easily log out of a free service as I can unsubscribe from a paid service. Um, you know, we the 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 user centric era puts the power in the hands of the consumer, but the consumer wields that power with big tech. They use their iPhones, they use their Google phones, they use their CTVs, their Samsung TVs. So the weaponry they use to battle uh, overpaying for something is the big tech that's in their hands. So big tech, the big tech uh, Death Stars are are basically the 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 canvas by which these folks, um, you know, paint their own bundles. Um, I'm going to go back in time and then I'm going to answer your question. So the misperception uh, about the cause of the current media apocalypse is that it's the death of the cable bundle. 
And that's just part of the story. The, the reality of it is that the cable bundle, the video bundle that MVPDs and pay TV services have been offering hasn't been profitable for them in over a decade. Kind of the it's loss leader, problem. right? For the other two. It's services. a lot. It's the marketing yeah. hook of the yeah. triple play telephony and broadband. And what people fail to realize is that, you know, basically starting at the beginning part of this century and moving up to about, you know, a little less than a decade ago, the, the gravy that came from broadband in particular and telephony, um, which were add on services that cost the, the MVPDs and ISPs very little to add on to video. So they took video as a loss leader. That was the marketing hook that got people roped in. That's a lifestyle bundle of services that each home subscribed to. And the gravy from broadband and telephony was what enabled the cable companies to overpay for ESPN and CNN and USA and all these other services. And, and that's what enabled the, the, the publishers to overpay for sports rights and Mad Men and Walking Dead and all these other television shows. It's the disintegration of the triple play of that lifestyle bundle that ha is really the cause um, of the uh, falling apart of the entire media uh, ecosystem, the, the media apocalypse, because television became a bad business for Disney and Disco Brothers uh, and Paramount all of a sudden because they couldn't overcharge for these channels. Now, that triple play, that lifestyle bundle, is that's not a new idea, right? That's been around for t almost 20 years. Um, it's been replaced by Amazon Prime. That's the new lifestyle bundle. So we went from a super aggregator called Comcast to a super aggregator called Amazon. And that's the new table stakes. You have to be part of one of those bundles in order to survive. And increasingly, you're going to have to provide one of those bundles yourself in order to compete in the user-centric era. You're going to have to provide a suite of services across their hierarchy of feeds to satisfy your high-end user enough to generate uh, sufficient revenue per user on a monthly basis to maintain a business that's competitive. Um, Amazon does a really good job of this. Apple is actually hitting a wall. They had a really bad earnings call um, this past quarter. But if they can combine, you know, and they have Apple One, but they're not doing a very good job of selling it. But if they can combine their cloud service, their new service, their arcade, their music, television service and service to a device as part of that bundle on a regular basis, that's a, a, an Amazon Prime competitor. I think uh, Google is beginning to, to, to make a, a bundle that is almost unbreakable. And it's not just YouTube uh, regular, which is now the most watched television channel on the face of the earth, by the way, hmm. uh, more, more watched on TV than Fox and Netflix and CBS and anything else that's out there. Um, but YouTube Premium, YouTube TV, YouTube Kids, YouTube Music, um, that's becoming a real suite of services that the home can't do without. Um, and you're going to see those things connected more and more. NFL Sunday Ticket was a really smart move for them. You know, it's going to be hard to justify the cost based on the profit of that one product. But then when you wind into, you look at the number of new homes they have for YouTube TV and YouTube premium as a result of that product, that's a good product. They spread that's it out across everything, right? The cost of that, that of acquisition. And, and what, one quick question, follow-up question. On that's the, on the, the but that's the competitive landscape. And if you want to look at a smaller, real, uh, just to, to finish this thought, if you want to look at a smaller, less big techie version of that, look at the New York Times. The New York Times has probably one of the best lifestyle bundles, one of the best super aggregation platforms in media, um, gaming, podcasts, news, food, sports. Um, this is a really tight package, and they're doing it with 10 million subscribers, not 200 million subscribers. Um, they're gr and by the way, a creakier, more out-of-date business you can't imagine than the old gray lady in 2010. And they transform themselves into a best in breed lifestyle super aggregator bundle in a way that none of the rest of traditional media has been able to do. Sorry, I was you were going to ask another question. No, no, you're that great, great. That that makes makes a lot of sense. So I want to go back to revenue for a bit. I just had a question pop up in my mind as as revenue is coming in and, and being accounted for and tracked or projected. What percentage do you think of that revenue is just people hanging on and forgetting? to release the, the subscription. 
Like that's an interesting point to me. Bridges. What would you basically? Yeah, I think that's you know. Um, and by the way, how much of how much of Amazon Prime's revenue comes from people not using the service? They get <laughs> you know? mine from not being accidentally subscribing and then not having the time to find out how I freaking unsubscribe. Yeah, yeah, it's really hard to unsubscribe from Amazon Prime. It's also <laughs> that one really is difficult. Um, uh, yeah, I think it's a decent amount, um, but I think the what you're seeing in the increase in churn is that's going to get lower <laughs> every quarter. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing is in the United States, we were supposed to be in a recession right now and we're not. Um, I think if ec time, economic times were harder, you'd start to see that lesson quicker. Um, but I do think, especially for younger consumers um, who, you know, are more active, um, older consumers are really cost conscious right now. Um, and so they are canceling services at a higher rate than anybody. Um, younger consumers when they when they stop using their parents money to subscribe to shit you know and by the way like you're 26 and you're still in your parents life insurance right or health insurance so at least in the united states mark doesn't understand any of that because he's not from this country um socialize socialism well I, uh, i'm from the uk and as you know i'm I don't think I left home until I was like 30, but yeah. Yeah. Well, and by the way, that's, that's the new norm. I mean, you know, for good reason, a lot of people in, in young Gen Yers and older Gen Zers are staying at home, not because they love their parents, although there is a, a, a demonstrable closeness between generations that wasn't present for, you know, my generation. We just had fucking hated our parents and they're the boomers. So, um, kind of deserved it but the, <laughs> the the but the to save money um for economic reasons people are, are are staying at home longer so that they can bank more of their paycheck um and and save their money for you know travel and buying a home eventually and things like that um they're also waiting to have kids so that expense is being delayed as well so i think as you see uh, millennials become parents and homeowners you're going to see less and less of the breakage, less and less of the kind of just retention through inertia um, that has been traditional uh, in the uh, in the subscription economy. And I think with Gen Z, as they start to leave home and, and go out on their own um, for the first times in their lives, you're going to see that really drop off. Um, and, you know, what's interesting is that younger consumers, same survey, by the way, younger consumers are much more likely to pay for content than older consumers. So they have no problem paying for it. Um, but they want to get their money's worth. Um, and, and the best example I can give you is Spotify. Like they, 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 you know, they are very active Spotify paid subscribers. Um, but they, that's a product they touch every day, every day. Um, and they share subscriptions with other people. So it's a real high use case. Like I get my, I squeeze every, uh, piece of usage out of every dollar I spend on Spotify as opposed to some of these other services where that's not true. They're sharing their music as well. They're living like they living in the musical universes of their friends and their peers. And I, I wonder when all the, these generations leave home and take their U YouTube subscriptions with them, what happens? I mean, you've spoken a lot about the next generations and how this will sh change your, your map, your, your universe. I mean, like the, the New York times, how much of that is held up by generation X and how much, um, will the next 10 years change your universe? Will it change the, will it change the, the death stars? I mean, you've mentioned that maybe NVIDIA will become a death star. I, I, I think they are a death star. They're worth a trillion well, dollars. They, they, are they up to a trillion now? Um, I think Tencent maybe, uh, might become a, a, a death star. Is that going to change yeah. a lot? I mean, they're held back. There's the there's the Chinese government cap that that is always on uh, any any China Chinese company. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the New York Times has pivoted incredibly well. I think part of that is demonstrated through their gaming product. Um, their gaming product is is a best in class mobile gaming product that has a really wide demographic um, uh, play to it. Their food product, um, their food subscription product, has a really good intergenerational. Um, uh, 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 audience to it. And then they bought the athletic, um, and then basically fired their entire sports department, I think in particular to attract. So their, their gaming product and their food product really attracts, um, a primarily, uh, uh, I would say queer and female audience. Whereas I think their sports product attracts a much more heavily male, um, 
audiences. So I think, you know, uh, I think the greatest uh, thing that the New York Times did first led by um, by uh, Mark Thompson and now by their new CEO, Coppet, um, is change the culture there. Um, you know, yes, they changed a lot of their, the aspects of their business model from, you know, print to digital, from advertising description first, from a single product to a multifaceted, um, you know, uh, uh, lifestyle bundle. But crucially what they did was they hired a bunch of 20 and 30 somethings as project manager, managers and product managers, and empowered them to make decisions on the ground without running everything up to the C-suite. And that cultural shift um, was really the most important thing that they did. Um, and so I think, um, you know, right now, you know, as consumers, uh, there won't be a more important block than uh, Gen Y and Gen Z for the next decade, and then Gen Y, Gen Z, and Gen A for the next 25 years. But you also have to understand that as the as the deciders, you know, right now, Gen Y and Gen and Gen Z are about 45 or 50 percent of the workforce in the United States, a little less than Europe because Europe is super old. Um, but, um, you know, by the end of this decade, it'll be 80 percent of the workforce are millennials and Gen Z with Gen A taking up a decent percentage of the remainder of that. So companies will shift their mindsets based on who's in charge and who's, you know, the deciders in the room in these companies. Um, I think though, you know, when you, whether it's, I think Microsoft is a great example of a company that is pivoting, you know, from Gen X and boomers to Gen Y and Gen Z. Minecraft, um, they just bought Activision. Um, so they are a company that is shifting their product set um, to meet consumers of new generations on a, on a, on a regular basis. I think Google does a really nice job of that. Um, I think Amazon, um, does a decent job at that. I think, you know, I think they don't utilize Twitch as well as they might, um, as a, as a significant part of their overall ecosystem. Um, I don't think their music product is as good as it should be to, to, to really apply to gen, uh, Z and gen a in particular. Um, you know, I think Apple is facing some issues. Um, I think, you know, you, crucially, I think Apple's products skew, uh, first of all, they skew to the rich. Um, you know, the cost of their products are exorbitant. Yep. Um, and, you know, they, they, you know, every single one of their hardware products fell in sales in, uh, in uh, third uh, quarter, except the iPhone. And it only went up to the iPhone one only went up 2%. Um, so I do think that there is... Uh, you know, built-in obsolescence, obsolescence fatigue setting in uh, for some Apple devotees like myself. I didn't buy the 15. Um, you know, I also kind of wait for the new, I, you know, like I wait a couple of weeks to install the new iOSs these days because like it's usually a dumpster fire the first couple of rounds. Um, you know, so I think, you know, I think Apple... I think Apple's facing a generational crisis right now. I think, you know, Tim Cook is 60, some 65 years old, I think, um, you know, and, and being queer is not enough to make you relevant. Um, so I think he's got, I think it's time, you know, it's, 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 you know, you, 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 you they lost Johnny Ive, like Eddie Q is old as well. Like it's, it's probably time for a generational shift at that company. I mean, the, the CEO of Microsoft, the CEO of Google are much younger uh, uh, than 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 him. Um, you know, the CEOs of Meta and all, and some of these other companies are also younger than him. And I'm not saying you you have to be young in order to be relevant, but when you look at the companies who are facing issues right now, they're 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 run by old white men. And and when Co you look not at the a coincidence, yeah. no, it's not actually. It really uh -huh. isn't. Where do you, so this, yeah, I totally agree with you on this generational shift. It's coming. We're starting to see it. We're, 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 we're projecting the potential effects of it. So where, so these new pilots that are going to be driving these death stars and these ships, where are they going to be pointing to? Do you think, what do you, what do you see as the trend coming out? Where are they going to be steering their death star towards? Can, can I well, just add a, a quote from Evan to that question, actually, from, from one of his um, um, blog posts, Frenemies at the Gates, I believe it's called. Um, 
And I quote, from this moment forward, half of the real potential value of any IP will come from the community economy. This translates not just to content, but also to brands. Publishers who only rely on the traditional content economy will leave half their upside on the table. Producers who only sell B2B will only find their slog getting sloggier. And brands who only buy reach from the gatekeeper economy will find themselves upsurped by competitors who create communities that they control themselves. Is that, I think that plays into what me and Jeremy have been talking about a lot recently in this community generated content. Anyway, I just thought I'd add that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, most people call it the creator economy. I call it the community economy. Um, and that's because at the end of the day, and, and what's interesting is you still have to go through the gatekeepers of TikTok and Google and, and Meta and, and the rest to get to the, to your community. But they do enable a direct conversation and relationship with your community that you can control. And, and the more platforms you're on, um, the more you control it. So if you if you dedicate all of your efforts to just one platform, well, then you're beholden to that platform's alg algorithm for your relationship um, to your audience. But but what what that I really mean there is first of all, uh, so consumers now see creator led content as as equal in quality to professional content or Hollywood content. Um, and now the big shift of the last 24 months is advertisers also see that. So two thirds of advertisers based on a survey from this year um, now see creator led content um, as equal in quality and greater in effectiveness as uh, professional content or Hollywood led content. Um, secondarily, um, you know, the value you can get from going through gatekeepers and selling to gatekeepers is there. It's not going away. It's just going to be um, shared. Uh, the pie is going to be split into two with the community economy. Your relationship directly with your consumers. The New York Times has a wide audience of people that they reach on social. Um, but the, the, the great value they have is the, the relation, direct uh, user relationships and consumer relationships they have with their most valuable consumers. Um, Netflix is very good at not letting people subscribe through the App Store or Google Play. This actually came out in a court case um, you know, that's uh, happening this, this, this past week. Um, they force you to go to their platform, either their app, uh, actually, their app on on here or to their website to subscribe. Um, but but more importantly, um, your ability to have a direct conversation with your own community and whatever the size of that community is, it does again. The New York Times has ten million subscribers, not a hundred million subscribers. Um, you know, Patreon uh, is another good example of that. Substack. You know, I I have my own user base on Substack that creates basically all of the value I have in my enterprise, not only through the subscriptions, which are nice and generate a decent amount of revenue for me, but the passion that even the free users have for my Substack or my writing on LinkedIn generates all of the uh, larger uh, revenue buckets, either from commissions on, on, on white papers or clients that I get for consulting, all of it comes through there. Um, and every conversation I have with a client starts with, love your stuff, love reading your stuff, read your stuff every day. Um, and that's because I have my own relationship with my own community that I control. Nobody uh, curates it for me. Nobody censors it for me. And this is going to be true for brands. When you look at the Duolingo TikTok uh, channel, which I think has 8 million um, followers uh, at this point, or you look at the Washington Post TikTok channel or the Crocs TikTok channel, um, you know, or, or brands that have very active content, uh, uh, uh relationship, content led re relationships on Instagram and snap, um, and other places. Those are the brands who rely less on paid marketing and much more on organic marketing. Uh, on the efforts um, that their content and their and their brand values generate for them on a regular basis, um, and so that's that's a big part of it. The second part, so I do think you're going to see, um, you know, that's why Microsoft bought Activision um, to amplify. You know, Minecraft is this massive, massive platform. Um, you know, what sixty percent of the planet's uh, eight to 15 year olds, or what I'm not exactly sure the age range, but somewhere between seven and, and, and 15 play Minecraft. What was that percentage? Sorry, 60. Yeah. Wow. 
And I think one of their issues is that they then then they turn 15 and stop playing Minecraft as much. And so the Activision purchase, which also has Blizzard in it, um, and a bunch of mobile and and online games, um, that's meant I think to kind of add on to that kingdom and add on to that ecosystem so that they can keep those consumers around for a longer period of time. Um, you know, LinkedIn. Um, as much as I think uh, people on other social media platforms make fun of LinkedIn, it's the last bastion of peace in social media. You know what I mean? It's the last place. It's the last place in social media where being a douchebag isn't celebrated. Um, and except for me, I'm also a douchebag. <laughs> um, but but it, it is it is a it is a community, um, and so they, they you can see the community based. Uh, ecosystem that they're building. And by the way, NVIDIA with GeForce, um, if you want to play uh, Fortnite on an iPhone right now, you have to go through NVIDIA. Um, and their open uh, source collaboration uh, Omniverse platform, uh, uh, um, Omniverse platform um, you know, where people make games together you know, across space and time, that's another community-led uh, uh, platform. Uh, for them. Uh, uh, Google, I think, you know, as much grief as I, I and everybody gives them for anti-competitive monopolistic practices, you know, the YouTube community is a very, especially when you dive into individual aspects of it, very tight knit community. Think about book talk uh, and all these other places um, that exist that are all community led. Um, so that's, that's where I think you'll see one aspect of the Death Star is pointing. The other is the fastest growing 20 economies on the face of the earth are in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. 50% of the population of Africa are under the age of 20. The fastest growing incomes on the planet earth. Now it's not mean they make the most money, but the fastest growing individual incomes on the face of the earth are all in Africa. So when you want to see where the opportunity is growing, um, you got to look to where the opportunity is actually growing. You know, North America is pretty stagnant. Uh, Europe is in decline, um, mostly because their age demographics are upside down from the rest of the world. There are big parts. Japan is completely upside down. China is completely upside down, dem demographically speaking, right? Um, but when you look at other corners of Asia and you look at uh, all, almost all of the African continent, that's where the opportunity is grow growing. So I think when you when you look at successful companies, um, over the next 25 years, they should be investing heavily where the growth is happening. You know, you get in early and you benefit when when the markets mature. Um, so to me, that's the, those are the those are the great um, areas of opportunity. And then it's a generational thing. Generation A um, is coming up fast, right? They're 13 years old now at the highest end. So you know, when they turn 18, 19, and 20. There's going to be brand new businesses built around their consumption of education, um, of entertainment, of food, of automobiles, of clothing, um, of technology, um, and they're going to buy in different ways. And so companies who are investing heavily in understanding that audience uh, will also do well. Epic Quick. changes. Quick it sounds, like, it sounds like you need to get on TikTok, Jeremy, for the thinking on paper brand community, because I'm not doing it. Oh my gosh. It hurts my brain a little bit, but, uh, no. So Evan quick thought experiment on the creator economy. Okay. Uh, I read a book a while back, uh, by Tim Wu called the master switch. I thought it was a really yeah. cool illustration of open and closed fun. systems and how they, how they interrelate and, you know, net neutrality, right. Is about access to your audience in a way. Right. So how does, how do these death stars start to see like folks like you and I and Mark, we're building these great communities that we control and we access and we monetize, you know, do they look at that as, as a existential threat at some point? I think, I think there's this misperception. I, I call them death stars. So that kind of like, and that's more built around their anti-competitive practices, frankly, all of them are monopolists at, at heart. Um, but <laughs> Um, no, they really don't. Most of these, when you talk to the, the, the strategists inside these companies, they don't see content creators, whether they be public service media in Europe, um, or publishers here in the United States or individual creators as com competition. They see them as fuel. They, they see us as fuel. 
Like I, I, I power the Apple platform. I power the Amazon platform. I power the Google platform, um, you know, because of the content I put out there. Right. Um, you know, I get Google alerts and this is part of my narcissism, but I get Google alerts, you know, based on stuff I've said or written, you know, on a regular basis. That means the algorithm is using me to generate information and content um, for their users. Google can't survive without creators. Amazon can't survive without creators. Meta can't survive without creators. Um, now, the, the, the fairness in their transactional relationship between the two definitely needs to be reoriented. And I actually had a conversation with somebody about the great labor reawakening that's happening in this country when you look at the SAG strike, um, the, the writer's strike, but also the UAW strike and the healthcare strike and Starbucks went out on strike yesterday. Um, I think you're going to start to see like Reddit saw with mods um, over the last year, I think you're going to start to see creators go on strike against platforms like TikTok and YouTube and Meta. Um, you know, to get better uh, uh, shares of revenue and better treatment by the platforms. I think it's only a matter of time. Um, but what I think you'll see in reaction to that is if, if creators decided to take their toys and leave en masse, um, if Mr. Beast woke up one day and led a, a creator's revolt against Google, Google would crumble. Google would, would, would cave because they can't survive without the content that the creators and publishers provide. They are, they are not a, a creator platform. And as much as, you know, Amazon likes to talk about, you know, the content they make Lord of the Rings and, and Jack Ryan and that other uh, stuff in, at the end of the day, the, the, the users generate so much more value for them than any of the, the professionally produced content. And that's both as a shopper, <laughs> by the way, and as a, as a user of their, their various other products. You know, the data that Amazon has is entirely user generated. And that is, you know, the whole value of the Amazon platform is the data that they generate. It's crazy. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's like it's like then the value of the platform becomes this this purely infrastructure play. It's like audience infrastructure, right? And that's the value there because as a single creator, I can't build that kind of infrastructure and network in this like this. Why would you want to? It would be so expensive. Yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. Don't. Yeah. I don't want to be in the tech business. I, 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 that's a, that's a losing business. And and just like Comcast and you know the the pipes of past that you know they're kind of agnostic at the end of the day and should be um you know amazon wants to sell you a television set and they want all content to come now they want to lion they want to take a big chunk of every dollar that passes through that gate but at the end of the day if the content providers go away from that television they're fucked absolutely yeah. This has been, this has been an amazing chat. We're trying to be mindful of time. I know you got a lot of things going on. Mark, you had some, did you have some hot buttons you wanted to end with, with Evan before we get out of here? I'm just thinking what Mr. Beast could do if he just decided one day to wake up and say, I'm, I'm creating Beast TV. Who's coming with me? Um, yeah, it's been fascinating. Uh, I've got another question to add. Is that book stack behind you books to be read or books you've just read? Uh, not just, but I've, yeah, I've read all of these. I mean, a bunch of them are travel books, you know, that, that, that I use, uh, remember travel books. Um, but oh, yeah, yeah, no, I've read, I've read all, I've read all these. That's the nine 11 commission, man. Um, that's good to great. One of my seminal books, that's Neil Gaiman, Philip Roth, Michael Shambon. Which Neil Gaiman uh, book? Uh, that is in that, Nancy boys. Oh, Nancy nice. Boys. Yeah. Graveyard book is one of my favorites. Yeah, I'm a huge, uh, that's John Irving, widow for a year, Forged in Crisis, which is probably one of the most important books about leadership, uh, Eating Animals by Jonathan Seffern Farr. Um, yeah, so yeah, those are all books that I've, that I've read. And by the way, it's not, a, it's not a stack. It's a, it's actually a bookshelf. Oh, oh it's good. magic. Very clever. Um, any pull through on the travel? Do you know pull any through? Pull through? What do you mean? Travel book. He's a travel writer. Oh, no, no, no. I check him check him. out paul through i think you'll like him okay um yeah we, we end sometimes with a couple of hot buttons this is just to to know our guests a bit more personally kind of what drives them behind the scenes so a, a few okay. a couple of one word answers to questions if you Ooh, um, one word yeah one word um rock or reggae rock sopranos or mad men sopranos Roblox or Fortnite? Roblox. 
Sony or Nintendo? Nintendo. Um, and I know you're a big Star Trek fan. And I wanted to ask you actually about one of the things you wrote about the, the depressing nature of modern television and how there's nothing optimistic for children to watch, which um, I kind of agree with you. But um, Kirk or Picard? Ooh, that's tough. That's a hard one. I don't know that I can choose. I mean, I, 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 I love Picard. Um, but I mean, I spent most of my childhood pretending to be Captain Kirk, so I'd have to go with Kirk. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, and, and just crucially there, the, the point of that article that you're referring to is, uh, Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek, um, with something that he called infinite diversity. And this is in 19, in the 1960s. Um, and science fiction used to foretell peace and prosperity. Um, the first time we saw a cell phone, the first time we saw a GPS, the first time we saw an MRI, the first interracial kiss on television, were all on Star Trek. Uh, they went on a peaceful mission to make the universe more sustainable for all species. Um, now, every superhero movie, every sci-fi movie is post-apocalyptic. So basically, like it assumes the apocalypse has happened, and now what? What if we start as writers and creators to not assume the apocalypse has happened uh, that assume that the apocalypse didn't happen and that what society looks like on the other side if we green light more optimism and less apocalypse might we also inspire the next generation of roddenberries or steve jobs um you know might we inspire more creation and less destruction that's a challenge accepted on my behalf my next uh story will be non-apocalyptic i don't think we can end on a better note than that jeremy i think that's wonderful thank you that's amazing evan so thankful that you joined us today we we love your work we love following uh where you're where you're seeing the future going and um we'll be posting some follow-ups my uh, mark does a great write-up and we'll include links and everything uh with that so thank you for joining us another thank, thank you. you to our friends at uh, ripple w-r-i-p-p-l-e marketing's on-demand talent platform Check them out if you need to flex out your team for a project. Mark, where can everybody find us? Everyone can find us. And so I don't know if, if you didn't know, everybody, we've launched a book club. If you go to thinkingonpaper.xyz, you can learn more about me and Jeremy, watch all our past shows, get show notes on all our guests, and join the book club. Um, in fact, the first ever book club email will be going out in about 20 minutes. So you have 20 minutes to sign up thinking on paper X, Y, Z or Z. That's it. Thanks for joining everybody. Evan. Thanks again. We'll see Thank everybody you. next week. Have a great week. No, we won't because we're off next week. We'll see you in two Ooh. weeks with, with Neil Redding. Oh, there wow. we go. Good awesome. Guess. See you then. Bye.